And today we're going to be in uh, Colossians chapter 3, verse 5 through probably verse 11. Um, but as we begin this, um, what, what we're getting into is a section where Paul starts talking about what the Christian life really should look like. So once um, salvation begins to do its work within the heart of a believing person, um, how that would manifest, how it should begin to manifest in their lives outwardly, okay? And so as we get into this, um, what I want to say is that I am um, very much aware, very acutely aware of the fact that I am not a perfect person, that um, we're all flawed in many ways, and I'm one of the uh, flawed people of the earth. And so um, there's many ways where I don't measure up to God's perfect standard of morality. And so I always approach these kind of uh, sections of scripture with a little bit of trepidation, just understanding that um, the holiness of God is so far beyond me. Um, and so when a human being is forced to teach, you know, this section, the section like this of scripture, where you're talking about the holiness of God, the perfection of God, the moral standards of God, um, that you're sort of forced to teach above your pay grade, right? Um, so I'm very aware of that. And also, um, I'm also aware of the fact that this idea of a um, objective moral standard of God is anathema to our culture and to our world that very much um, embraces a subjective moral standard that each person gets to choose for themselves what is right and what is wrong. But, you know, that in fact stands in direct opposition to the teaching of scripture. Um, and, and so um, what Paul has been laboring to do up to this point in this letter is to really show us that the true identity of Jesus Christ as God, the creator, the creator and designer of everything that is, okay? All space, time, matter, and energy of the physical universe was created by Jesus and through Jesus and for Jesus, okay? As well as the entire dimension of the spirit and every spirit being. Everything that is was created by him, through him, and for him. And as the creator and designer of the universe, um, God, Jesus, the creator, has put into place laws to govern how the different bodies within that created order um, interact with one another and function as a whole that, so that the universe operates according to the design of its designer, okay? And so just as he's done that for the physical universe, so also God has done the same thing um, for humanity, giving us a, a, a moral standard, an objective moral standard um, that is to govern um, human behavior. But really there's two reasons I think God's given us this standard. One is because humanity has drifted. We've strayed from our original design. God designed humanity um, in his image. He created man and woman in his image, right? And so after the image of our creator, we were actually designed, but sin has caused us to drift from that design. Okay. And so one reason for the moral standard of the law of God is to, um, remind us who we are and, and to show us this is how you were designed to operate and the other is to give us a guideline by which we might live um, a, a goal this is the bar where we are supposed to be living and as we do live more and more into that design um, that's when we experience the greatest fulfillment the greatest meaning in life okay and so um, with that let's just start back in verse 1 the focus today will be on verses 5 through 11 but in verse 1 Paul says if then you've been raised with Christ seek the things that are above where Christ is okay and this is speaking back into that concept that the work that God's done in us in regenerating us right in in taking us from a creature that was spiritually dead to a creature that is spiritually alive um, it, it, that that's represented in, in baptism where the old person, the old Jeff has been crucified along with Christ. Okay. My old identity and every identity that I brought to the cross um, it, of, of the sins that I once walked in, the person I once was, how I once behaved, how I once thought, how I once reasoned that that person was crucified with Christ. And now the new Jeff has been resurrected with Christ. And now um, that that's happened, now the rest of my life is spent being sanctified, being renewed, being changed further and further into the image of Christ, okay? And so he's saying, if you've been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on the things of the earth, for you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. Okay, and so he's saying, listen, um, when you're living your life out on this earth, okay, knowing that you've been redeemed by the blood of Jesus, knowing that you've been saved from your sin, knowing that the old you, the old man, the old uh, woman, the old um, um, sin nature 
uh, that, that you came to the cross with has all been crucified with Christ. D no longer seek the things that are below, okay? In other words, don't trust your five senses. Your five senses um, that are so immersed in this world, so interconnected to this world, um, your own sense of right and wrong, your own sense of justice, your own sense of morality. Don't, don't trust those senses any longer, okay? Let that person die, those things connected to your old identities and your old sin nature. Okay, just let that die, let that pass away. He says, says if you've been raised with Christ and you're a new creature in Christ, don't seek the things that are below anymore, but seek the things that are above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. You need to lift your focus higher than the things of this world, the reasoning of this world, the knowledge of this world, the understanding and morality of this world, and seek the things that are above where Christ is. And he says, set your mind on things that are above. Don't be so immersed in this world that you think um, in, in, on the plane and of the, according to the wisdom and the knowledge of this world, but rather set your mind on things that are above and not on things that, of this earth. He says, for you've died and your new life, the life that you have now that's hidden with Christ in God. And when Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. That's that final perfection, okay, by which Christ is going to return, catch you up to meet him in the air, that he's going to transform yours and my lowly bodies to be like his heavenly body, okay? And this is, this is our final perfection, our completion in Christ, when the work of redemption and salvation is made finally complete and we are actually perfect, right? We're made and restored back into the image of our creator. That's the fullness of our redemption. He made human humankind in the image of God. And, and at the end of our redemption, when we are finally completed, then we are restored into the image of our creator. So verse five, he says, put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you. Okay, so just put that to death, that old identity, everything you brought to the cross, put it to death. It, it's dead, it's been buried with Christ. So put the dirt on it and pack it down and let it just be dead. Let the old you be dead. And he begins to list the things um, um, that should die along with our old identities and our old us. He says sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming. Okay, so he's pointing out these sins. And these are a list of sins that I think a lot of us think of. You think of, you know... Um, the, the, the great cities of the past or something that have, you know, fallen to sin. These are the ones that begin to show themselves and manifest. And we all think of, right, as, oh, these are the big sins, okay? Sexual morality, which just means any kind of sexual activity outside of the covenant of marriage, okay? So sexual morality, impurity, that a little bit of sin can kind of just dirty a whole, a little bit of dirt, a little bit of filth, can dirty a vessel that's otherwise unclean, that is otherwise clean and sterile, right? And so sexual morality, impurity, passion, evil desire, covetousness, which is idolatry. We know what these things are, but anything that comes before God, anything that we're putting before God, that we're, that we're allowing in our lives, um, that we know displeases God, all of that is idolatry. We're bowing down before something other than God, okay? And he says, on account of these, the wrath of God is coming. In verse seven, he says, in these two, you once walked, when you were living in them. Okay, so these are all part of your old nature. These are all a part of the identity that you brought to cross to the Christ. This 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 subject of identity is a huge thing in our culture, isn't it? Um, and, and it's 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 that way in um, those who would say, hey, listen, I am this gender, but I identify as that. I'm this nationality, but I identify as that. I'm from this people group, but I identify more with them. Right? I'm this racial identity, but I actually identify as that. Um, and, and there's many ways that that's done overtly, but it's not always so overt. Sometimes our identity is all wrapped up in, in our political affiliation. Sometimes it's all wrapped up in our profession, okay? For me, this was particularly true um, when I transitioned from ministry back to a regular just job, my business, right? Where um, my identity was really wrapped up in, in being known as Pastor Jeff, okay? This was really important to me and, and I sort of had an identity crisis when I left um, vocational full-time ministry and went back to a regular job. It was like my, I had an identity crisis. Who, who even am I? You know, I like being called Pastor Jeff. Um, but, but it can happen for anyone. You know, I'm identified as a business owner, or I'm a politician, or I'm a police officer, or there's many ways that we can get all wrapped up in our identity. We can also be wrapped up in our style, or, our, or you know, I'm a punk rocker, or, <laughs> you know, whatever it is, there's many ways. But he's saying, basically, um, these are all the ways that you once walked. These are all the identities by which you once identified, but that old you, that old identity, that old nature, that old person, 
has been crucified and buried with Christ. And now this new person, the, the, the new identity is in Christ. That this new identity is the only one that you should be identifying with now. He says, in these things, in these sins, you all too, you also once walked when you were living in them. But now you must put them all away. Okay? So that old you, that's who you used to be. But now you got to put all that away. Just let it die. And then he begins to continue his list here. Okay? And I think a lot of times people think this is a secondary list, like a lesser sins. We already talked about the big sins. Now we're going to talk about the, you know, the, the more common sins, right? Um, but this is not two lists. Paul is continuing one list of sin because all sin separates us from God. All sin is an affront to God. He says, now you must put them all away. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk from your mouth. Okay? So he begins to expand on this list anger and wrath and malice and slander and obscene talk like do you have a temper problem are you easily offended and you just get your dander up and you just want to stay in your anger and not let it go he says that's sin that it needs to be put away from you wrath wrath is like hey i'm mad and i'm gonna let everybody feel my wrath i'm i'm gonna i'm gonna take it out on everybody around me malice malice is is evil intent malice is you know I, i'm gonna I want something bad to happen to that person. I'm going to make it happen. In fact, it, maybe I'm not even going to make it happen, but I'm going to I'm going to sort of wish it on them. I'm going to put the juju on them, you know, and just oh, I just want to hope something evil and bad happens to them because I don't like them. They disagree with me. They think differently. They're they're a different people group. Whatever it is, that's what malice is. Slander. Okay. I mean, how much of this goes on in our society and even in Christian communities and churches? Slander. Just just I'm going to. It's just it's just. Um, I'm gonna do damage to that person's name, okay? Whether it's just or unjust, just slandering someone, just saying something about them, doing damage to their name, whether it's true or not, right? Obscene talk. When's the last time we heard a dirty joke and thought it was hilarious and shared it with um, some other people, right? These are things that are common in, in us, right? And, and he's saying this all has to be put away. In account of these, in these two, you once walked when you were living in them, but now you must put them all away. And he says in verse nine, and do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices and have been, and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. Okay, this is a very important passage, okay? Walk in the truth, he's saying, just as God is truth, right? Just as, just as he is in the truth, we are to walk in righteousness and holiness just as our God is holy, okay? This is obviously a high calling, right? But I love this section because it puts it into perspective in verse 10. He says, well, in verse 9, he says, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self, he says, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator, okay? This is so important because I think sometimes we have this idea that as Christians, um, we want to put this on other people, sometimes put it on ourselves. We have this idea that, hey, I thought that person was a Christian and yet they said this. I thought they were a Christian, but they watched that movie. They listened to that song. They told that joke right? Or, or me, like, ah, I'm a Christian, like, why am I having these thoughts? Like, why am I struggling with this thing, you know, or my temper, or my anger, or my, or, or this, this temptation, or whatever it is, right? We have this idea that we're supposed to be already perfect, but, but this verse is making clear that, that, that he says, you've taken off the old self with his practices, you've put on the new self, but, he says, which is being renewed, in knowledge after the image of its creator. See, this is the purpose of our salvation, that we eventually will be restored to the original design of humanity, right? The image of our creator, being made in the image of our creator. This is how Adam and Eve started out. They strayed because of sin, and since then we've all been born into that same sin. We carry a sin nature. We have all these other identities that we wanna to bring to the table, but the only identity that matters is that I wanna be one that is, in, is made in the image and lives in the image and, and speaks in the image and prays in the image and blesses in the image of my creator. He says, we are being renewed. That implies process. Like from the moment that we come to Christ, oh, that moment we're not perfected. And in this life, I'll never be perfected unless Jesus comes back and makes me perfect when he completes that work that he's begun in me. Philippians says, I'm confident of this, that the good work he began in you, he will also complete it at the day of Christ Jesus, right? He says, we are being renewed and we're being restored. We're being, that, that the image of our creator is in the process of being restored in the life of a believing person, okay? And so from the day that you believe, from that moment, 
you're 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 being you're being slowly and, and, and steadily renewed and restored. And that original design by which God created you, that design which he intended, and, and which, was, which is inherent in the person, like this is how I designed you to be and live and speak and interact with me and with one another, that, that, that original design is becoming more and more apparent and obvious in the life of the believer, okay? He says, you've put off the old self, you've put on the new self. Um, and it's being renewed. It's being renewed at the moment in the image of its creator. Okay, in this last verse, it's so important, and I'll wrap up with this in verse 11. He says, Here there is not Jew or Greek, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and is in all. In other words, all of us want to identify. We all want to hold on to some identity. We want to be known as this. Like, I, I'm Italian, and so we Italians have, you know, attitudes or, or you know, whatever it is. I, I'm not going to go on into that. But we have identities that we carry. My profession, my nationality, my racial identity, my sexual identity, my, my gender identity. Whatever it is, we all bring identity. And we try to hold on to this. Of, this is the thing that defines me. But when you've come to Christ, right, that old identity, all those old identities, all those things are to be put away. All that is to be shed. That's all buried. It's crucified and it's buried and it's put in the grave and it's never to be resurrected and what comes up in its image in its place is the image of our creator a new creation a new self and our only identity at that point is in Christ because when I stand before my father in heaven there's going to be one thing that matters that I'm standing before him clothed in the righteousness of his son Jesus Christ and when he looks at me he's not going to see pastor Jeff or Anglo Jeff or or whatever He's going to see that one was redeemed by the blood of my very own son who died for him. That one, okay, had all righteousness fulfilled for him by the perfect life of my son. That is my adopted child right there. And that's the only identity that matters. The only identity that matters for the believer is in Christ. That's it. Here there is not Jew. There's not Greek. There's not American. There's not Israeli. There's not Palestinian. There's not Chinese and Japanese. There's not black, white. There's not Hispanic. There, there, there is no other identity. There's not Jew or Greek or circumcised or uncircumcised or barbarian or Scythian or slave or free or rich or poor or any other thing. But Christ is all and is in all. And that is the all the identity that we need.